Authority uh, Board of Commissioners. Can we have a roll call? Uh, Chairwoman Peck. We got it right. Commissioner Christ. Commissioner McCoy. Commissioner Yarbrough. Lauren Selling, Assistant <coughs> Director, LHA. Tim Hall, Assistant City Attorney. Kendra Daniels, County Supervisor. Sarah Arty, Public Safety. Holly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Commissioner Hidalgo Perry. Commissioner Martin. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Do we have any? Oh, oh. Harold, oh. introduce Harold. yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm direct, Executive Director of Harold Committees. Does Erica need to introduce herself? Yeah. Erica, I'm the Executive Assistant. Thank you, Erica. Anybody else? No, we're good. Um, do we have any uh, agenda revisions or submissions of documents for this meeting? We do not. Can I have a motion to approve the March 21st, 2024 minutes? I move that uh, we approve the March 21st, 2024 minutes as presented. Second. We move by Council, uh, Commissioner McCoy, second by Commissioner Hidalgo Faring. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimously. We're now at public invited to be heard, and you have three minutes per speaker. Um, there's no sign up list, so. Shaquille was the first one I saw into the room. Strider was here before I was. Oh, Strider? Strider well, Vincent. Uh, a little, little unprepared. I just got this material two hours ago. Oh, my goodness. From the uh, Bill Van Dues and from the San Susi house in the uh, uh, trailer park in the South Boulder, 2018. Uh, but anyway, the basic thing is. I don't know if it's a new management or they just started acting that way, but uh, uh, two to five months ago, um, and everything has been so attacking us that it's, it's hard to know when and what and what transpired. But all of a sudden they started attacking almost all of the trailer park owners I got this note on my door after I was at church one night. I come home and um, said, I have not paid my rent. They, are, they already had my rent for two days. And they never acknowledged to me that they had already cashed my money order. But they did tell Susan when we had the mediation meeting. Um, the mediation was, uh, uh, there's a young girl local she didn't know anything. She just been trained to be abusive. And there's a regional lady who was uh, um, just everything is absolute arbitrary. Has nothing to do with uh, uh, you know health, safety, decency, anything like that. It's a violation of what we have been living under. I've been there for 15 years some for 20 or more years, and everybody gets these threatening notices on their door every week. It's arbitrary, it's not clear. Um, like one example, it says you cannot have a clothesline. Well, the trailer park put in the clotheslines, you know, and, uh, and you, you cannot hang up clothes, uh, you know, to dry. Well, trailers aren't big enough to have a dryer, so. And many of those things, um, you, uh, it says, I cannot have a filing cabinet. Well, there's nothing in the words, but it, they say filing cabinet counts. They call it intern, internal furniture. Well, you can't even see it. It's about like this. You can't even see it unless you're standing right in front of it, looking at it. And uh, they, they said, well, I got, I got two small tables in case friends or, I mean, I'm a writer. I, I like to sit out in the sun and, and, and have access to my material. And uh, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, you, this one, you cannot have this one, you know. And it's totally arbitrary, it's absolute. There is no mediation, no consideration, no acknowledgement. I had cleaned out 95%. I had quite a bit of stuff there because my church squeezed my, uh, 
my bigger storage locker into my smaller one and everything else got stuff there. So I got rid of that. 90, 95% of it. Stan had some stuff at my place. He got his stuff out. I, I bought a, had to buy another uh, uh, trailer uh, uh, storage locker. And um, at one point, the example of uh, just one, one quickie, the, uh, the, the regional manager said, well, you could have a lattice. But then in the same sentence, she made it into a lie. You can have a lattice, but you can't have the tarp to protect against the wind and the snow. So you have to tear that out anyway. And it's just everything is arbitrary, absolute, so, and different uh, from the last 15 years. All so, of a sudden, it's a whole new set. So are you still working with uh, Susan Spalding on this? Um, well, I'm willing to, but I, I want to work with LHA and Bill Van Houston just told me that we have rights under the law that I need to learn about. Okay. All right. Thank you, Strider. Thank you much. All right. Sure. I have nowhere to go, and I'm in Section 8, so okay. my life is expected. Uh, kill the law 219 Francis Street. I just want to mention that the clothesline prohibitions that Strider uh, was complaining about, those are actually quite common in HOA neighborhoods throughout the city of Longmont. Uh, so this is a thing that actually affects many people in the city of Longmont, and this is an extremely unfortunate example. Um, so just food for thought. Uh, so uh, commissioners who are also happen to be mayor and members of council, uh, in partnership with, Long with Prosper Longmont and Longmont Public Media, Launch Longmont Housing is kicking off a book club to bring members of the community together to talk about the rising cost of housing in Longmont and potential solutions to that problem. The first book that we are reading is called Escaping the Housing Trap by Charles Marone and Daniel Harridges of the nationally recognized organization Strong Towns. The book describes the tension between the financialization of housing and the need for housing as shelter and the actions that municipalities can take to address the crisis of housing affordability. We invite you and any member of the public to join us in reading the book and having a conversation about what we can do as a community. For more information and to sign up for the book club, go to launchlongbondhousing.org. Our first meeting requires no reading and is on Monday, April 22nd at 6.30 p.m. at Longmont Public Media. We'll have a presentation with all the information you need to get the most out of reading the book, and also we'll include a presentation by Elizabeth Bodwin, the Curator of History at the Longmont Museum. Uh, we've placed this event on the council calendar in compliance with the Colorado Open Records Act, and Launch Longmont Housing has purchased a copy for, of the book for each one of you. Um, we'll have them at the next at the next council meeting because the book's not out yet. It'll come out next Tuesday. Um, members of the public can pre-order the book at Barbed Wire Books or place a hold on a copy at the Longmont Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, Shakira. Before we accept gifts, we have to know what the price is. Yeah. I believe the book retails at twenty-eight dollars. Okay, next. Uh, well, I was going to mention uh, Strider's situation, and what it is is that you got little uh, charities, HOAs, and we've got this situation where we got the corporations buying up trailer parks because they figured out that they could buy them up, and they got trapped people and they raise the rents a lot. Sometimes they try to intimidate everybody that they start enforcing rules to try to make it pristine so they can basically resell the place. So what it is is the city I think really needs to it you know adapt some of the state requirements so stuff could be enforced on a local level by the code people uh, because trying to get an enforcement through the state uh, is a difficult process. If it's local and they, and the other thing is a lot of these HOAs and trailer parks what they're doing is they're trying to keep you know minorities and marginal people basically exclude them from housing. Uh, things like restricting parking on the street. You can't park in your own driveway. Um, 
a lot of it stuck. The city, I think, needs to enact um, basic rights to people because essentially um, the state law has something. If you're just an irritating person, a lot of times you'll get forced out of your community. Now, the state law says if they're doing something like that, it's a violation. The city really needs to make things like that part of their local ordinances. So a code inspector can actually enforce some of this stuff instead of trying to get some overtaxed state person to do it. Um, and things, things like when people are trying to rent a place, Banning, you know, you got landlords taking deposits from people, not deposits, but just to apply for a place, they're charging like three or four hundred dollars just to apply. And then they don't want to give it back if you don't get the place. The city makes, needs to establish, you know, there's actually the HUD regulations saying that's illegal. But trying to get a federal thing enforced is almost impossible. Uh, you have to file a federal lawsuit against the landlord that didn't give you back your hundred dollars. Right. A lot of times it's more, two or three hundred dollars. And most people don't know about it. But if there are local rules that make it safe for people to rent, make it so people aren't being excluded okay. through things like, oh, you can't park on your own street. Thank you very much. Seeing no one else, I'm going to close the, uh, the public hearing. <coughs> the public provided be heard. Old and new business, the Swedish land concepts. authorization to execute an easement for the Dry Creek Trail that the city side parks department is working on designing right now and hoping to begin construction on shortly. Um, let me zoom since this is pretty tiny. Um, so what you see here is going to show that, but that is being drafted right now, that easement is being drafted right now. Um, so that is not yet totally in effect, but it's a little bit challenging to see, but the proposed trail alignment is here in the thatched orange, and the trail easement would be this green line, the blue line you can ignore. Um, so the reason we're talking about this tonight, however, is that um, we do have an option agreement to allow element properties, the same developer did, 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 that did Zinnia, to develop this back lot behind the suites. So there's some history in that that Harold might jump into because he was involved at the time. This was a little bit before my time. But when LHA was trying to build Fall River, they needed extra cash on hand to help close the deal. And so they approached the city and said, would you buy out half of the land behind the suites, just a, a paper exercise, not necessarily splitting the lot itself, um, to be in the ownership structure of that land so that we could get some um, funds to help finish the Fall River project. And council at that time agreed, uh, the property acquisition occurred, and so now the city and the LHA own this back lot behind the suites 50-50. Mm -hmm. um, as part of the Zinnia, when we're working with Element on Zinnia back in, gosh, maybe 2019, when they were first getting started, um, the option agreement was for the area where Zinnia is now plus this back lot. And so that was the phase one of the option agreement and this area is the phase two. Um, we were reviewing that option agreement when we were considering this easement to see if it would trigger an amendment of any sort and it does not. It would just require consent from Element to be able to construct that easement. 
Um, but it did make us start talking to Zinnia um, Element about what we should be planning for back there because the option agreement requires that Element obtain a LIHTC award be by the end of 2025 for this option to still be in effect. Um, so in order to do that, they need to start get moving um, in order to hold the option as is. And so we just wanted to conceptually talk about what the LHA board would like to see in terms of um, a product back there. So we've worked in, in working on this easement, we worked with Element to do kind of a conceptual plan, very conceptual here, about uh, just to see what could fit back there and if it could fit within and still accommodate the trail, the trail easement, and knowing that there's a riparian set back there and the FEMA floodplain is mapped here as well, just to see what was possible on that back lot. So this is, uh, what you see here is a conceptual building housing 63 units. Um, you can see this is a drive aisle and potential parking area still and meeting the pocket park requirements that are assumed to be, that would have to go into site planning. But really what it looks like right now is um, certainly feasible 63 unit building. How many um, stories? I'm sorry? How many stories? So Zinnia is four stories, mm -hmm. a podium with wood on top. So I would assume it would be the same there, similar. Um, so we just, we brought this to the advisory board here last week, just to say if you wanted to make any recommendations to the board, um, start thinking about it. Um, they asked for an outline of some options to consider. And so that has not come to fruition yet, but we really wanted to start the conversation with the board and then um, we don't need to take any action tonight, but it's more brainstorming ideas to eventually give some real direction to element on what you all would like to see. So, wasn't this the property that when we had you and Harold and I mm -hmm. talked about the Dolores project? Yep. Mm -hmm. That um, I I personally would really want to see that. Mm -hmm. So Something very similar to the Dolores project. Mm -hmm. um, so for for the rest of the board that members that weren't on that tour about yeah. half ago yeah. or so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was there. yeah, I was there. So we went down to Denver. Mm -hmm where they have a, a, an affordable housing development that has a 45 bed shelter for women and transgender people, and then permanent supportive housing units attached to traditional affordable housing. And so people could, the idea was to show hope and move people along and transition them up and out. Um, and so that was a super interesting idea. I totally agree. The one challenge that we've come up with since then is that they got that shelter element paid for by the tax credits because it was in a QCT. This side is not in a QCT, so the t tax credits couldn't pay for the shelter. But, so there would have to be another funding element attached to be able to do it that way. So that was the one piece of information we figured out since then. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, what's a QCT? And second, um, do we have enough um, like first floor housing for mobility challenged residents because that comes up every so often and it seems like designing it into the beginning would be a good thing. Qualified so census tract? Yes, it's qualified census tract. So mm -hmm. HUD designates qualified census tracts each year and LIHTC mm -hmm. projects in qualified census tracts essentially get, they, it's kind of a bonus on the credits. Mm -hmm. So they could um, attach, for example, if the ascent was in a qualified census tract, the ECE could be covered by the tax credits because it's a service for the residents, but it's also more for the broader community. Mm -hmm. In this case, if it was in a qualified census tract, the tax credits would pay for the majority of a shelter or mm -hmm. services or some sort of um, service-oriented element mm -hmm. of the project. Mm -hmm. And then the second question on uh, mobility units. We have, we are actually, LHA, when you consider the entire portfolio, is exceeding the minimum required for mobility units um, when you consider it all together. That's why in Aspen Meadows, when we did the construction project, we actually added extra mobility units to make sure that the entire portfolio was covered. Um, so we, we are meeting the requirements, I'd say. Okay. Um, the reason that I ask is because 
uh, people living not in non-LHA properties on vouchers mm -hmm. uh, frequently seem to be claiming uh, mobility limitations and then they get a bad neighbor and they can't move around inside the building that they have a lease for because of accessibility of the, of, of the uh, unit that they're in and they're in like the only one or something. Um, so the, and that so that's the reason I asked because people can't can't get away from an odious living situation right now. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so a couple of things that we've talked about um, to kind of uh, put some frame, a framework on the qualified census tract. It's it's inherently the same issue that we um, are dealing with with ascent with the ascent project. So, you know, when we were looking at the early child care component, um, had the ascent project been in a qualified census tract, we could have put that into the basis of the project. It wasn't, so we're having to look at other fun options for that piece in early child care in, in that facility. Um, one difference in this location, while it's not in a qualified census tract, um, it is in, a, in an enterprise zone. So one of the things that we can do is really dig in um, and potentially pre-certify um, with the state as part of an enterprise zone. Um, and that may be able to do something similar um, that you would see in a qualified census tract. Uh, but we'll need to dig into that a little bit more. Harold, did you mention something that I didn't quite understand it? Um, that Michael Block from Boulder Shelter had mentioned something about uh, wraparound yeah. services. Uh, can you explain that? Well, I think when we, when we look at the area and we look at what options we have, I think one of the concerns um, that has been brought forward to Molly is, you know, right now um, every unit on the site is permanent supportive housing. And, and so there is a conversation about watching the density of permanent supportive housing in a single location. Um, and if you think back to the Dolores project, you know, one of the things they had was they had the shelter component, they had permanent supportive housing, and then they had what we would consider traditional affordable housing. Um, and that was one of the, the pieces that Molly and I have talked about is, you know, that's really kind of the missing piece of this site is more of that traditional affordable housing that we build. So that could be an option that the board could consider. And, you know, we've thrown out other options in terms of if, if you look at a podium style structure, potentially um, having space to bring um, to lease to service providers who um, serve members of our community um, that utilize permanent supportive housing and affordable housing as an option. Um, we've talked about utilizing space for some of our services that we have as we're running out of space in, in this facility. So there, it can really be a mixed use concept in terms of ground floor activity um, services. Um, than other components to this, but I think what they were communicating to us, and Molly, correct me if I'm wrong, is really watching how much permanent supportive housing we're allocating in a single location. Yeah. Right. So, um, would it be possible with a four story building that part of it is the shelter, part of it is uh, transitional? But could not one floor be uh, traditional housing as people move up and out? Would that take care of some of the concerns that there wasn't enough traditional housing? Um, I think the concern is more how many permanent supportive housing units. So once city is built, we'll have 130, eight, 82. Um, and so I think the, the concern that was coming up is just, it was more of a request. Please consider how many high needs people are going to be on site um, and considering how the interactions with each other or, um, so just thinking about having opportunities 
using that back lot for ways for the existing permanent supportive housing residents to be able to you know, look towards the future as well. So that could include services, that could include traditional affordable housing. Um, that That's more of an extension of, of the comment, but that is where it was coming from. Okay. Uh, for me, it, it, it would round out the idea of a campus type of solution for people in need. I'm not going to say just unhoused or, but even if someone is living on their own in their own unit somewhere else, they could still use hopefully the wraparound services like addiction help or is that what we're thinking about as well or is it just contained to the Swedes area at uh, Zinnia? Um, I don't know, this is just a thought process that I'm kind of going through. Well, um, our, our, uh, it, it seems like this other concern may, may weigh more heavily because we don't want to ghettoize any kind of subsidized housing, which means that we, we you know, we, we, I would say that, that while I really like the idea of wraparound ser and basic services for um, street living people, I propose things like that multiple times, but um, maybe this is not the place for it because we want um, a, a more functional group of people living in this uh, situation and providing role models and and um, and just not uh, you know not not lumping all of the the um, people who need a lot of services together. You know, I I mean we don't want to end up with something like true I go right. I was in St. Louis when they blew it up. And we don't want to get there. So I, I would like to see it something more upscale, maybe even a, a combination of unsubsidized, but you know, 80% type housing and, and low income. Mm, problem with that is HUD financing and um, grants. And so the, the factors that, I'll say this, the factors that will weigh in regardless. Once we have an actual deal, there will be a market study that will will say if that area and the general market in that section of town could support certain percentage of, of affordability units, so 80%, for example. Um, that market study will drive a lot of the decision making on the investor side, and so that would that would be telling. Um, I would say that something that this site has going for it is that we constructed 55 units of permanent supporting housing, permanent supportive housing, with virtually no public um, negative comment. It is, it is a site that is traditionally, if you're gonna, if it's going to face opposition, then that is often when it's in an established neighborhood mm -hmm. or. Um, near more single family residential. So that is something that this site has going for it. So it is, I think it's just something for the board to balance. Mm -hmm. um, the concentration argument versus the campus argument, if you do it, do it well right. with the services, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're all pieces to, for you all to weigh. I, I just wanna make note of the fact that out of um, Sunset Way over here in Portland Parkway, right in this court, um, is a very active child care center, which uh, supports these businesses in this area. And so um, when we're talking about density in terms of people that need a lot of support that might be at odds with the child care center being that close. I've just seen that on my side of town. Um, Would you like, do you mind if Sarah Okay. Yeah, I, 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 just, I just saw it sure. on my side so of town the suites, uh, I mean, it's been there for quite some time. And as far as issues with um, residents, there's, and there's a lot of residents, I mean, if you drive in there, you're constantly seeing them going to the gas station, walking around. We have not had any issue, uh, I mean, I would have to look it up and maybe one or two. Very minimal issue with the residents that are currently living there. 
I read it, you're, you're correct. It, it's going to be more dense. But um, we, if we look at the data that we have, I don't think that we could support that it would be an issue. Um, there could be an offshoot of a problem, right? It always happens. But what, we're, what we've seen in the past doesn't, doesn't indicate that we will. And when we do have a problem, um, the folks at the suites are very apt, they're apt to contact me or public safety police if there's an issue. Same with the daycare center. They, they're, they're very willing to call us. Yeah, I'm just to what Sarah's, I'm sorry, what Sarah's saying, I think, you know, one of the reasons that we actually have a security contract on the side of the suites is probably more about the people that are residents of the suites mm -hmm. that are impacting the livability of the residents in terms of some of the issues that we're seeing. Um, you know, I think we're in a better spot with our residents because uh, the last time I was at a coffee and conversation and coffee and conversations with Sarah, they were telling us you need to look for this problem here and this problem here and this problem here. So. And it's interesting because we're seeing that external influence into the suites that um, I think in some cases actually challenges the residents that live there. And to add to that, with this additional construction and creating more density, um, we've seen that it, the trend is a lot of our unhoused folks are, are looking for a private property. They know that it's taking longer for them to be moved along, so we have had issues up up along this ditch right here on the north side, uh, significant. They're gone now, but it took us a long time to do all the work to move them along. Mm -hmm. So with with more, more people in there, I don't see the issue of the, uh, I'm not saying they'll, they'll be totally gone, I don't see them visiting that area as often. We have up on Collier and 21st, uh, even a stabbing there years ago, which happened right outside that, uh, and, and yet the child care center persisted. But as soon as the people on North Longmont, um, the businesses there started having trouble with um, people breaking into their garbage, there was a lot of traffic pretty much up 21st, and um, camp encampments along the railroad tracks there. I think it's a perception problem, but then parents don't want to leave their kids there, and now that child care center has closed. So we have lost most of them. Mm -hmm. Well, we've lost it in our neighborhood, you know. And so I, this one is very active, and it supports those businesses in the area. And so, you know, on the positive side, we have affordable housing there, and they have a lot of uh, access to that kind of service. Very close because it is uh, industrial. There's lots of work you can walk to and then child care would be right there too. I'm just worried about too much density being a problem for parents when they see that drop in the zone. But just because the fact that my we miss that day child care center. And that's one of our goals is to keep those child care centers open and provide more and safe. So. Are there any other thoughts on what this property should be used for or well, Georgette said we need some more, um, George, what's her name, Georgette said we need some more um, buffets. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's not wrong. We've lost our buffets. <laughs> <laughs> so, because this is city and LHA land, whatever mm -hmm. ends up happening would end up coming back to both, but I just wanted to start the conversation um, and give some ideas to Element. So if you'd like to express any now to, to have Element look into, or if you'd like us to come back with some options, we could do that too. Um, are we looking at a particular demographic? Yes. You know, because we have a whole lot of housing aimed at senior residents. We would like um, to apply some demographic pressure in favor of younger people staying in Longmont or even moving to Longmont if they have jobs here. Um, so would some kind of Viva, uh, Vivo, whatever it's called, kind of concept of something that is for people aging out of foster care or just, 
you know, people coming out of out of their own families and mm -hmm. and starting at an entry level job and leaving. Uh, is is that a possibility? Though, though, pe such people might be more resilient um, in terms of uh, acceptance of their neighbors. I think what that would be is traditional affordable housing, mm -hmm. and then when in design, you try mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, just like we are designing a scent to be family friendly, we're not going to do a preference necessarily, but um, that is something yeah. that we could do to try and so like singles and young couples friendly, the aesthetic and etc. So our what amenities. space are we? Here, we should just stop sharing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Were you hearing them from the back or did you say I'm hearing voices? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> from the great beyond. So, Thank you. Um, are we looking at the city of Longmont land or area? or It is one where parcel joint owned jointly, so it's not okay. split up. It's not split yeah. up. It is so. this general parcel starting from the, okay, the so back this that where section. you have the images of the pocket parks and all that that, that was, was all conceptual okay yes. so that kind of confused me then so um yeah, if I can, yes if I, could jump, if I could jump in real quick when we, when we purchased the property again this is before the city was involved in the housing authority mm -hmm. um they uh they needed seven hundred fifty thousand to close on fall river uh, okay. The city, with affordable housing funds, purchased property for okay. 750. We took a majority ownership interest in the property, and at the time, we negotiated where we have ultimate control on the property in terms of what was developed on it because we didn't have the housing authority. Now it's a little bit different since we're intertwined with each other, yeah. uh, but that's a bit of the history on that. So um, I'm going to just pop in a minute. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I was going to finish what I Oh, I'm I sorry. Asked, I, I was, was, no, no, no. I was just asking Go to kind it. of, um, well, you know, so something I would like to see is, and I know it'll cost, there's going to be an ongoing cost component to this, is really, I mean, I'm thinking about the life skills, wraparound services. How can we get people who are in these units and even other residents or other individuals or unhoused um, who, you know, getting folks on a trajectory to be able to live a sustainable life. So knowing how to pay bills, knowing how to budget, knowing how to find a job and keep a job. So having some kind of um, place or a hub that we can tap into, you know, along with city funds and LHA to be able to to support um, ongoing sustainability for residents who are kind of like on that verge of, you know, they don't have those skills to to keep a job even. Like they might find a job and then they can't sustain it. So, you know, we're looking at that sustainability piece to help people stay in housing and help people stay employed. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. It was. Actually, we should applaud. <laughs> so, um, I liked Marsha's idea about um, children aging out of foster care. Yeah. I think that I is like perfect. That. But also, um, Mr. Yarbrough mentioned together um, mm -hmm. with the, with the kids yes. who were in that program as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of those, you no, know, I should say a lot. They might be couch surfing uh, individuals as well, mm -hmm. so they do fall under or could fall under the homeless or unhoused umbrella of people who need housing. Um, just keep that in mind. I don't know where they fall in any kind of paradigm of help or under the LHA requirements to be able to be housed. Element had actually proposed that as an idea very early on. Oh, they did? About youth. Mm -hmm. Love it. Mm -hmm. I think we should look at that. Um, mm -hmm. I really like Marsha's idea, and I know that 
it would be nice to have something like that here in Longmont for our youth. And mm -hmm. I don't know if any of them even know how to fill out applications for yeah. a voucher yeah. and um, to be on Section 8, you know, or, you know, any of that. So to be able to have a point place to go to, mm -hmm. knowing that it's here in Longmont just for them, yeah. would be amazing. I can't even imagine, right. honestly. To me, that's part of supportive services. Mm -hmm. It isn't just supporting mental or physical health, but it's skills. Skills, yeah, life skills. Oh, oh, there we go. go. <laughs> okay. Any other really good suggestions? About five. Mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, the buffet could be on the bottom floor. Hey, that's what okay. those kids are doing. Oreo cookies and mm -hmm. all vegan stuff. Oh, no, rooftop. <laughs> oh, rooftop. <laughs> a rooftop buffet. Oh my gosh. There, there is this that. trail over but here. But they used to lead to, to the China buffet. But <laughs> I don't think the China buffet is in business. Make anymore. that oh, building high enough. Mm -hmm. We can shoot our fireworks off of it. That's a huge parking lot over there. There's a lot of pavement right now. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Uh, I think we're getting slapped. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We have two more. Um, yep. We have some more Thank to cover. Thank you for the feedback and well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Annie and Millie's Place Partnership Update. Right. I'm going to take that, Lauren Sally. Um, I got this update from Lisa, our uh, regional housing or regional property manager. Um, so she's been in contact with Annie and Millie's. They hosted a veterinary clinic in partnership with the Street Dog Coalition on January 30th. And they had a follow-up clinic with booster shots at the on the February 26th. The suites. She said, "You guys are interested in having Annie and Millie's do more with yes. our residents, not just with LHA residents, but also um, voucher residents." So uh, she has been in contact with the organization. Um, they are very interested in doing more. Their board is currently working on clarifying their current programs and looking to expand and build partnerships, and they're in discussions to hold annual clinics at the suites, Zinnia, and other properties. Mm -hmm. So they're seeing how that will work in with their mission. Um, and then also interested in expanding past PSH, but also you know people who were on vouchers within the community or are truly at risk of becoming unhoused. Um, they do help cover costs of um, veterinary services, especially as they escalate, mm -hmm. they will um, look at the costs and see if they can partner with other orga other organizations and vet veterinarians in Longmont to cover that. Um, and they have some upcoming events. May 5th, they're gonna be at St. John Episcopal in Boulder. They're doing initial vaccinations and general well checks, spay and neuter vouchers. Mm -hmm. June 1st at Bethlehem Lutheran here in Longmont mm -hmm. to do follow-up needs for May 5th new uh, guest initial vaccinations and well checks with more spay and neuter vouchers. And then June 22nd, um, again at Bethlehem here, at Lutheran here in Longmont, um, to follow up from the June 1st visit and then any additional necessary check of care mm -hmm. needed. Great. I love making mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So this was a, uh, a discussion that was brought up at the February 20th LHA meeting, so this was just a report back based on that information mm -hmm. okay. we researched. It. Do, do we have a density map of where housing choice vouchers that are not in LHA properties, where, where they are being used? I'm thinking particularly about countryside mobile home park in the context of Annie and Millie's because there was a veritable population explosion of chihuahuas there. <laughs> I'm serious. This is no. I mean, every yeah, like, you know, so there are some. Un, there's clearly some puppy milling going on there because because everybody's got two or three. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. And I mean, you can't you can't. They're good security dogs. Yeah. Well, <laughs> whatever. There's a lot of them there, and they might need care. Okay. Um, and and especially some kind of a low cost spay and neuter. Oh, event yeah. might be good. I don't know if it's somebody's side gig, then maybe not. But um, so Andy Swartz, who used to be with Hope, mm -hmm. he is um, involved with them now, and I could connect the two of you. So That'd be great. He's involved with with Countryside or, or with, with, with Andy and Millie. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I know Andy. Mm -hmm. 
And we do have plans to, um, to we, we don't have a map showing voucher holders. Uh -huh. However, we are in talks with the other housing authorities mm -hmm. on getting information to their voucher holders who live in Longmont. Mm -hmm. So once we have more information about this, we can just send that to their program people and have them disperse that information. Okay. We don't have a reciprocal agreement to share the data about mm -hmm. the residents, so we have to rely on them to share that. Yeah. No, I was just thinking of, it, you know, if, if it, as a housing authority, is it worth our time to nudge Annie and Millie's into a direction of a particular neighborhood. I think targeted outreach is yeah. possible. Yeah. I think you should contact Becky Doyle and get an app for that. <laughs> she's she's pretty responsive. I mean, I've asked her for weird map layers and she's still <laughs> up with it. Yeah. You're just on a road to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. It's so cold. It's so <laughs> big. Your brain <laughs> wrapped up in a blanket. <laughs> I don't know. Um, are there any more comments on Annie and Millie's? Mm -hmm. And you are done with your update. Thank you. I thought it was uh, very interesting. Um, now, um, Commissioner. Hidalgo Ferry, you had said that you would make the motion yes. for uh, Aspen Meadow Senior Apartments floor. Mm -hmm. Are we going to, did you want to, I think, yeah. Harold, I'll okay. open that item. Yeah. Uh, so, Commissioners, um, just a brief background on this. Um, Aspen Meadows uh, Senior Apartments is a property that they that is in the Longmont Housing Authority portfolio. Um, prior to um, the city integrating in with the housing authority. Uh, the Longmont Housing Authority was um, began a, the resyndication process, and so as you know now, that's when we go in and we um, get funds. We essentially refinance the, the, the property so we get funds to make capital improvements to to that property. Um, that all the development work and the design work was done prior to. Uh, the city getting involved with Aspen Meadows Apartments. Um, right at the point where we started combining in that transition, one of the first things that we undertook was actually having to secure the financing for that project uh, because the initial investor uh, fell out and we had to find another investor. So there was very little in terms of the architectural design and the other work that, that was all done ahead of time. Um, went through the process, um, made the improvements to the units, um, and we noticed that there were some issues um, with uh, flooring that we've been trying to resolve since late 2022 into 2023. Um, staff is requesting the board authorize us to file a lawsuit if needed. Um, and take all the legal ne steps necessary to um, preserve our claim. So I'd like to make a, a motion to direct staff to continue working on a solution to the flooring issue and take all necessary steps to achieve a solution, including if such action is deemed necessary, um, initiate legal action to rectify Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments flooring failure. Second. It's been moved by Councilor Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry to give direction to staff to continue working uh, with Aspen Meadows flooring and take legal action if necessary. Mm -hmm. Set moved by Councilor McCoy. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimous. Uh, six to nothing with Commissioner Aaron Rodriguez absent. We're on the interim executive director's report. Um, <laughs> development of the bonds. Sorry, first off, I'm going to the commission for indulging me tonight and letting me connect remotely. Um, I got something for my son who got something at CSU. Mm -hmm. So I uh, didn't want to risk getting you all sick as well. So thank you for allowing me to do that tonight. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to turn it over to Molly to go over the development updates. Sure. Um, so we are in construction at Village Place, Village on Main, mm -hmm. the Village 
to keep it simple, <laughs> still training my own brain. Um, we have our, we've done two wings now, one on each side of the first floor, and we've got residents moving back in. Generally, the feedback is very good about workmanship and materials, um, and then, but no construction job is perfect. So we are having, I mean, as people are living in it, now construction is starting into the common areas. It's gonna be more disruptive. So we're really trying to um, engage with the residents right now, work through requests and questions as they come, and just trying to keep everybody in good communication right now because we are hitting, about to peak on construction on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, the common areas will be worked on from now through the end of June or so. Um, construction work outside in the parking lot and on the exterior facade will be June through August. Um, so we're about to hit that peak. So trying to work with residents to get everyone ready. Um, otherwise things are going good on schedule, on budget. Yeah. So that is that property. Zinnia's construction is also moving right along on schedule. Um, they will be completing in September with lease up happening in October. We've been preparing with the entire team, um, including Element and Boulder Shelter and uh, mental health partners to prepare for lease up and use any lessons learned that that team went through on Bluebird Boulder, the sister project to this one, um, to implement any of those lessons learned since that's so fresh there. Um, so what do we have else? Ascent, we are rolling right along and to, to an anticipated closing on Ascent in July and then turn around and start construction at that time as well. So you'll see a good amount of um, items coming forward to prepare for that closing between now and July in the next couple of meetings, um, getting everything worked out there. In terms of the Early Childhood Education Center, we have promising news from Colorado Health Foundation we do not have an actual dollar value yet, but okay. it's just going through final um, tweaks of milestone mm -hmm. and, and things that they want to see kind of deeper in the agreement that would be coming. So as soon as we have that good news, we'll share it. Um, and otherwise, just a full court press on the scent. Um, we've got development opportunities coming at us that we're wading through mm -hmm. to see how to prioritize things, work on our, our projection about uh, when we need to time certain projects mm -hmm. through the next several years. And so that's all underway. Is there any other properties, Harold, that you wanted to touch base on that I didn't hit? No, one, one thing that I wanted to talk about that we, um, unfortunately I can't get into very specific detail now, but it is likely that we're going to need another executive session of the commissioners to talk about a potential development opportunity and get uh, direction to negotiators. Um, mm -hmm. This project is a little different in that it's affordable housing, but it's also potentially income qualified attainable housing. Mm -hmm. And the rental side, uh, Molly and I have had uh, a handful of meetings and Molly uh, discussing uh, different financing options. Um, I'm bringing this up today because um, we had a really good meeting today that uh, brought some clarity on how we're going to, how we can finance a project like this. And so um, just adding to what she's saying, uh, development opportunities are continuing to come in. We're continuing to evaluate those. Um, we do have the ability now to be, um, really look for those who can maximize our, our revenue potential and, and, and how that applies in the future. So um, we'll probably need uh, an executive session in May um, with the board to, to talk through some of these issues. Um, that's, that's really the big one for me. Um, oh well, when we look at this, I remember a few years ago, uh, before we started building projects, um, as the city council and as the housing authority board, you all set a target for us on projects in terms of the number of units that you wanted built. Um, and I believe that number was six units. Six properties. Six mm -hmm. properties in five years. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to just recap what you've seen, so Christman 2 was the first one. That's leasing up right now as we speak. Uh, Zinnia will be leasing up 
this year. We're going into construction on a set. Well, am I forgetting? Well, we originally oh. included. Um, <clears throat> yeah, project the, the the project that you all approved as the city council related to home ownership opportunities um, was number four. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, just wanted you to know, and that's equating to how many units, Molly? Oh gosh, I got to pull it. Um, it was something. A lot. I know over three hundred. Over 300 units in, in that time frame. I wanted to say that to you because I, I think the vision that you all set for us in terms of what we needed to do to uh, get, you know, one of your major points of, of housing, um, you know, you're really now seeing that start to, to move out of the system. So um, the work that you did in that goal setting session has really allowed us to see what our North Star is. Um, not really development related, but I did want to take this opportunity as part of the director's report to say you've also made a number of decisions that it's really kind of, it's really shifted the, the organization in a way that is um, making us better. But I think in terms of staff capacity, it's helped us a lot. And if you look at the, if you look in the room and you look at budget decisions that you've made, that has drastically helped us. Um, I can start with um, the one uh, with Tim Holt and, and really bringing in a housing attorney to work with us. And it's definitely streamlined the process, and made my life easier. You can look at Sarah um, and the work of funding the police officers. So Sarah works with us in dealing with the safety issues. Um, and then, um, obviously, with Kendra and the accounting and, and the work that we've been able to do um, in Molly, and, and the most recent addition is Lauren. Um, and I will tell you, when you said that, you actually said that as a goal for me as part of my city manager yeah. evaluation yeah. Mm -hmm. a few months ago that said you need a, um, an assistant director in, in this world. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, because that's what it's for. Um, and I can tell you what I've seen since Lawrence jo joined our team is it's just another critical piece in taking this organization to the next level. And, and we talk about this a lot. This is a we and this is a team of the commissioners and staff. And, and I really wanted to take this opportunity to thank you because what Molly and I have realized out of this is um, when you get the right people and you bring them that support, it's actually brought some calm to us as well and let us look further out in the future. And so, um, you know, not to set extremely high expectations, but, you know, the folks in this room are, are just killing it. And um, when you bring the right people together, you can do some pretty amazing things. And when you have the right team, including the commissioners, um, I think it just sets a different trajectory for us. So I wanted to say thank you. So you all cannot leave. That's right. <laughs> in your position. That's right. I wanted to compliment you from our last meeting that uh, when we got a chance to, to actually be on location and, let, and I think Harold said that maybe we would be doing that a little bit more often and I'd like to see that because I think it's great to see these things you know, up front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Oh, not at 8 o'clock at night, though. <laughs> <laughs> nine, 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 nine. Nine. <laughs> Just saying. So, so. I, I want to say right back to you, Harold, that um, I am so impressed with the team you put together because it's fun working with them. I mean, they're fun people. And, um, <laughs> I think that that's a huge uh, part of a team, is that you've got to enjoy what you're doing, you have to like who you're working with, mm -hmm. and be able to voice your opinion, whether it's uh, a, uh, an opinion that everybody agrees with or not. And, and I think that's what I've noticed, and I'm really appreciative of that, because you can't move forward and if you can't work together and just respect each other's viewpoints and come to a, a conclusion that actually moves you toward the target you're trying to get to.
so I think that the team you put together is amazing. And so, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. They're not shy. They're not <laughs> in that room with you that's shy. It doesn't seem like we are either, so that's good. Uh, so if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll move to the operational update. Sarah, um, do you have anything on public health and safety? I do, if you'd like me to go. Yes, yes please. All right. Um, so we've added two new meth detectors to um, ones at Village on Main in a non-construction area. Um, and the other one is at the Suites. We picked those locations for signal strength, so that was the real detriment of the first few devices that we had were signal strength. Mm -hmm. So those are, I'm monitoring those daily. Um, and we also have the one up at Fall River. So keeping tabs on that, we're looking at um, getting a quote to get some for Christmas too on the units that have not been rented. Um, also asking, you know, keep asking the questions where they are with their SIM card, where they are with their technology to, to kind of mesh with what we're doing here in one month. Um, another piece about meth, recently um, Heidi and, uh, and I believe one of the directors of uh, public health with the county have put together a meth task force with the county. Mm. They asked myself and Molly to be on that task force and um, as you know, it's a very complex topic, and there's a lot of challenges and impacts of, of use, and especially when it is regarding to our housing mm -hmm. industry. So I think um, due to our lens and our expertise and some of the things that we've seen and have experienced, we're going to be sitting at that table, and um, we're really going to be having conversations regarding you know, what, what to do, how to move forward, do we contact the state regarding lowering some levels um, to make to make things more feasible, et cetera? So once we have more information on that, um, we'll bring it to you. And um, I know that <clears throat> we met with, on a side note, but this involves you all, is that um, the whole meth, in, the meth information just in general that you had asked about, um, we met today with Molly a little bit, and, and um, Grant and Dane and Jeremy, and we're going to be putting a presentation for you together on that. Okay. So um, I'll let the other folks talk about when that's going to happen, but just look forward to that. Um, cameras, I think Harold informed you that he put a VBA for two weeks out to get this more, this ball rolling. He's shaking his head back there. No? Mm -hmm. Well, no, I didn't inform them. I pushed the people Push, doing it. That's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> he pushed the folks to get the VBA out. So that is exciting for us, especially the coffee and conversations. That's a constant question for our residents about cameras. What's what's the scoop? Um, very exciting that that's moving forward. And next slide will be working very intricately with with that whole system set up for cell signal, especially at Fall River and Spring Creek. Um, like I said, coffee and conversation have gone very well lately, and um, people seem to be, you know, a lot of the same issues keep coming up, and I think staff is doing a very, like, for instance, like a maintenance piece, but I think staff's doing a very good job, especially being, you know, we're, we, are, we lost some folks, we're trying to hire some folks, so I think we're, we're doing our best to keep up and keeping the peace with everyone. Um, and watch the coffee and conversations is posted on the next slide. I don't know who's doing that. I go next door. I'm next sorry, next door. door. Next door. Oh, oh, it's like, 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 it's it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's it's like, it's like, but I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know who's doing it. Do you know who's doing it? I don't. Oh. I think it's, it's probably people on the property. And so uh, the saying. property managers do a monthly, or I'll let Lauren, she, she knows more about it. But mm -hmm. I like I come in quarterly mm -hmm. and meet with them. Uh, on, the, on the camera piece that Sarah talked about, this has become mind-numbing work. Um, 
and it's it's not the cameras, it's the procurement process. So overall from a, the from the system standpoint, because you know we're taking more of a systems approach to this. We're bringing in general fund, which is the easiest, but we're bringing in CDPG funds and we're bringing in ARPA funds. And those two have created a nightmare in the procurement process based on the rules and, and late clarifications um, from the Treasury Department. Actually, believe it or not, CDPG funds are easier than the ARPA funds when it comes to this type of work because the treasury guidance is, is, is a challenge. So, but we think we've threaded the needle and we'll be moving forward on that. So Sarah, I'm going to, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Sarah, do you have anything else? I don't. I just have a question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. okay. I know that uh, the meth detectors haven't been in very long at all, um, but have you noticed uh, any difference that they're in? Have you um, like any of the units or anyone entering the building that has meth on them or been smoking it or so we have not placed them in any units that are occupied the okay. only units that we've had them in are unoccupied and had tested positive um, those were the units unfortunately that were were having issues with battery signal strength and we were getting we were getting the information that they're needing. Okay. The new platform that they've designed, um, we have not had battery issues. We're getting some um, indications and we're trying to follow that. Is it the vent, ventil is it ventilation through the hallway? You know, when we can see some of the cameras, if someone walked through and we're trying to pinpoint that with the data is exactly um, for time and date. So have we seen a few things? Yes, but nothing to, I mean, nothing to really press moving like it, this is all just information gathering at this point and what we're going to do with with the information okay. right and working with property craft and that's another piece that now that Lisa's is back we're following up with that company that gave a presentation to us that does i know harold talked to you a little bit about it and i think we did last last time but um they offer a different type of remediation and it's not oh, as right. costly mm -hmm. so um, working with those folks if we do find anything okay um so yeah, it's kind of a work in progress. Okay, I just want to make sure those meth detectors are working. <laughs> they are. But we're getting we're getting a lot of inquiries about them. Okay, good. So the, the battery issue, we knew they worked. Mm -hmm. It was the battery issue that we couldn't seem to figure out. Now that we're getting clear, I mean the batteries are lasting now, um, and and so. Um, we're ordering, Eric is going to order 20 ish. Mm -hmm. um, I'm using my contingency fund for that, and that's going to be a combination of both of the housing authority properties and some city restroom facilities. Um, so it's sort of the next le level of testing. Um, I have had conversations to Sarah's point with the ownership group that we partnered with on Crispin 2. Um, and Sarah's getting information so we can present it to them in terms of acquiring the meth detectors to put into the non-leased units. Okay. Um, that's important for us because the deal that we struck with MGL on that property is that in seven years we're going to take ownership essentially of both Christmas 1 and Christmas 2. Um, and so the more we can do to protect that property for that transition, the, the better for us. Of course. Um, and that was actually one of the first deals that we did. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So, is that it? I mean, that was all you have on your agenda, Carol? Did you want anything else? Um, operational updates from Lauren really quick. Okay. So, um, we have some vacancies in a lot of our units, um, a handful of meth units. Some, as you know, have been down for a long time given the amount of work that's going to go into them and lack of insurance that we have now. Um, but there are a few that are being cleaned or in process getting ready to rent, so we're seeing more turnover of those units and releasing those. Um, and I just wanted to say, as far as like an operational standpoint with staff, you know, coming on at this time and sort of getting my feet out under me, 
and getting a handle on things. It's been really eye-opening and great. I'm not moving as fast on things as I would like to, but um, really excited for the future and what's going to be coming. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was to give kudos to our housing choice voucher team, um, Aquila and Shelby. They just had an audit last week and got zero findings, okay, which is what so all yeah, their files great. were perfect. That was really exciting. Um, and then also since our last meeting, when you guys first met me, we had promoted Patrick, one of our maintenance technicians, to the supervisor position. And that created the maintenance vacancy that Sarah was mentioning. Um, and we are actively recruiting and getting ready to interview for that position. We've opened it up not just for a tech one, but a tech two, so that we can hopefully get some more skill sets in um, and have a lot of uh, future planning. So we have one technician who has HVAC skills and certifications, which is really important, for cost savings to LHA. And so we're looking to fill you know, future planning, more um, skills and certifications to sort of keep that, to keep that going and really create a pipeline and career progression for, for staff. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what's going on with our properties. We've been getting through a lot. Um, it's just going to be a work in progress for a while <laughs> for me <laughs> once I get used to everything and everyone. Um, yeah, we're seeing good results. So, great. If you guys have any specific questions. Do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you. If I could add real quick, some of the things that Lauren's already doing, I mean, these were the things we didn't have time to really dig into. But, so one of the first moves that she suggested that Molly and I were thinking is we actually moved maintenance to Lauren. So Lauren has direct supervision over maintenance, and so we, we bifurcated the property managers and the maintenance group. Um, and I've had a chance to meet with Lauren and, and Patrick and, and really setting out expectations about you know operational reports what you're doing and and empowering them to really get that information because that data is going to be really important to us as we assess what our operational capability is mm -hmm. um, and really seeing what we can get done on a daily basis and setting benchmarks in terms of unit turns and things like that and holding to it so part of why she's a bit overwhelmed is we didn't plan on doing this and we did, but we did, um, based on, on her recommendation. And, and then digging into things like we're dealing with reports right now and really her ability to dig in and give us the information, I think lets us assess in a different way versus getting caught in the weeds. And so that's really the operational capability that we're gaining out of this. Do you agree, Molly? Absolutely. It's, uh, if the intent was to okay let's dip our toes in and move from bit to bit of the areas of work that need attention but um, Lauren's style is a little bit more jump right in and let's just figure it out right now because you got to figure out the big stuff and then the rest can start to to fall into place easier that way so I appreciate it it's been a lifesaver <laughs> I encourage our staff across the whole organization that they are seeing a different Molly now. It's like meeting a whole new Molly because she has more capacity <laughs> to breathe. And so that's really great. Nice. They Thank said you, my Lauren's shoulders good. were never yeah. so relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And there's, I mean, I have a lot of plans. I have a lot of goals on, you know, streamlining operations um, where we can to gather more data because it's hard to make budget decisions going forward for not only new projects that we're planning and budgeting for for operational, but just for the organization as a whole. Um, and so we really need that data in order to make those requests. And um, so it's it's going to take a while, but I'm, I'm hopeful and I, we have a great team, so I'm not worried. It's just a matter of getting it done. The, the other thing that we did bringing this team together because it's really the, the next phase of the work that we have to do we um, we brought in um, a psychologist that I've worked with for 20 years almost now and um, we really focused on individual communication training so everyone went through and took a disc assessment um, which basically 
is the first look at, at how you approach the world and how you communicate. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what I really like about this disk assessment, it also tells you how you communicate under stress mm -hmm. and really getting everybody to understand each other's perspectives and how we work. What was interesting is we found some very distinct things that we needed to deal with uh, because almost everyone fell in a similar section of this. And part of that, the characteristics that we learned is we all, they like to, they hold things in. Um, I'm not bad. That's <laughs> true. And, and so really working and empowering people to not do that, that was a piece of it. The second piece of it was really um, what we call the print report. And uh, without going into too much details, what it, what it really does is, it, again, it's a, it, it looks at how you approach the world and what your best self is and what your shadow self is and how you react in certain situations. This is a test they're actually starting to use on public safety departments because what it's starting to identify are what are your triggers as an individual and how do you respond to certain things so that we can train and teach people to avoid the triggers. Um, we spent about two days doing that work with the team and different components and how they work with each other then as, as a broader group. And that's really been setting the stage for us in terms of communication and how we go forward. We're going to do some more training on this and, turn, and really get into things like resiliency and self-care and things like that because the stress is significant. But I wanted you to know that because I did that with this group, I also did it with my leadership team on the, on the city side. But we're going to start working more on this as, as we um, get down the road because part of a good team is good communication. And every time I've been through an after action review on any issue, communication is number one. And so this is really getting us to the point where we understand each other. So when Molly says something that triggers me, I know it's a trigger and, and I don't fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. Although she doesn't, she doesn't Happens all the time. <laughs> but it's really understanding or when I communicate to them because I'm the, one of the few D's or S, strong S D's in the group. And so I can trigger them based on how I communicate and it's helping me adapt to their styles so that we're, we are, we're, we're a stronger unit. So. That's the last piece of the operational report, but I just wanted you to know that not only are we working on the technical and the tangible, we're working on the teamwork side of this as well. Sounds great. None of us liked our shadow self. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever likes concerned. <laughs> I, I think that's a good idea for all of council too. Let's. <laughs> well, we did how, that. How do we uh, communicate? Two, uh, a year ago. Yeah, we did. Well, we didn't do this. I mean, it was similar, but theirs. We didn't talk about no shadows. No, <laughs> no, theirs is a little she bit. She did that to herself. <laughs> <laughs> couple of you because you came in after I did it. It's really insightful. Um, and what I will say personally, um, it's actually helped me at home <laughs> as much as it is anywhere else because a lot of, I can contain myself pretty well at work, but at home is when my shadow self tends to show itself. And um, I, it's actually helped me catch things. Um, and so it's as a board or a council, if you're interested in doing this, we'd be happy to talk to you all about it. Okay, great. Thanks for offering that up. So is that the end of the reports? That is the end. Yes. Okay. So can I have a motion to... Uh, well, actually, I have one other Oh, I'm question. sorry. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Holtz, did you need an additional motion from us to um, protect all of our rights in regards to this, uh, our legal rights? Yes, that was in the motion. It was included. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So can I have a motion to adjourn? I'm here. We adjourn. Second. And then move by Commissioner McCoy's and Vice Commissioner Chris. Thank you.
that we adjourn all those in favor say aye. Aye. Without that vote. Bye, Harold. Okay,